Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Soap from the Box, the podcast where I interview actor mates who have appeared in some of the country's biggest dramas, Coronation Street, Emmerdale, EastEnders, Hollyoaks, Casualty, and it's been a very exciting week in the land of Soap from the Box. I can't say any more at the moment, but more to follow. I'll let you get listening to this week's episode. This actress was part of the most probably important storyline I've ever tackled as a director in Soap, and we talk about that and lots more today so sit back get a cup of tea or a glass of wine if it's not too early and enjoy so my next guest on the podcast is charlotte bellamy it's very echoey because we're above a pub in harrogate hi charlotte hi (laughs) so um you played emmerdale's laurel thomas for 18 years which is incredible your first appearance ever on emmerdale was dressed as a bumblebee yeah and actually when i came into direct you were dressed up as a bumblebee again because it was a village Fate or something. Oh my god, they always get that bumblebee outfit out. For and me. do you remember what the first what thing you said to me was? Then you must do. No, I don't. Don't you? You came up to me and you said, "Oh, hello. Are you knew you on the book." <laughs> Which for people listening means got very low down on the set, and you stand with the script to, to kind of remind actors if they forget their lines. That's because you looked about <laughs> seventy. I did. Yeah. We couldn't believe it. I was like, "Who's that boy? <laughs> Who's that little boy?" <laughs> that was hilarious. So. The idea today is we'll spend a little bit of time talking about Laurel and Emmerdale and then a bit of time talking about you. So your first episode was in 2002 and you described her as daft and scatty, Laurel. Yeah. Well, what's made her stay in the show for so long? Do you know what I mean? It's amazing staying in the show for 18 years, I think. Have you kept Laurel the same throughout or has she changed a lot, do you think? I think... I think that when characters come in, or some characters, they're quite exaggerated and I think... Laurel, when she first came in, she was pretty mad and crazy and, yeah, dressed up as a bumblebee and and did mad things and had crazy clothes and funny quirks. But as a character kind of sort of nestles in and settles in, it it, it sort of dilutes, really, and becomes more real. Real, yeah. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? Longevity, I've talked about this a lot with other people, it's you can't stay the same thing the whole time because otherwise it wouldn't work, would it? I mean, it's very unreal in the fact that you can have affairs and murder people and stuff, but you still, it kind of has to be like that in soap, doesn't it? To stay in. Yeah, it has to be real, doesn't it? It has to be real. Now, you've done some amazing stuff. I mean, you literally, when I read the history of you on Wikipedia, and it's like a, you know, it's a novel, what Laurel's been through, it's incredible. So you married a vicar, John Middleton. Yeah who we must talk about, because a brilliant partnership, wasn't it, that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, John's incredible. And is it important when you get put with someone that, it, is it nice when you know it feels good? Do you know what I mean? When you're acting with a screen husband, that you've got that kind of amazing chemistry. Yeah, I suppose. I, I think with John, it was always so, just so easy. It just felt like a, a good, comfortable pair of shoes. And, and I think that, especially in a partnership, you know, when you're very comfortable with somebody and you do a scene, sometimes it might not seem like you're doing anything, but that's because it feels right, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, because it's and, interesting, I think, when you're in a show with a, as a couple, because it's not like you go through this, you know, week spending time with someone before suddenly you're playing their wife or their husband, which is true in any drama, isn't it? You, you're thrown with someone, and how do you think, how do you find that as an actor? To find, Is there a, a way of clicking with someone, or do you just literally have to run with it? Well, I remember my audition, there was, I got down to the last three, and I had to read with John. Oh, right. And so John was in the show first, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was in the you. show yeah. first. And I've never really spoken about this to John, but I, I, I did the worst audition. It was awful. I went to pieces. Oh, really? Yeah, it was terrible. And I, I can definitely guarantee that the other two girls were better than me, without a doubt. So you walked out thinking... So I know. walked out thinking, I've definitely not got that. And to be honest, I think John was probably quite surprised I got it. <laughs> Because I was really bad. So I think when I came through the doors, you know, to meet him on the first day, he was, he was like, always oh, like, God. oh, God, they chose you. Um, Straight upstairs. <laughs> yeah. Fire. <laughs> but as we got to know each other and worked together, I, you know, it became apparent that the, the, the chemistry was what, was right, really. It's funny you say that because Dina Payne, who I've also uh, spoken to on the podcast who played Viv, said she auditioned with the Bobs. And she said, I like all of them apart from number six. And number six was Tony. Tony. <laughs> and it's quite weird, isn't it? Because that does happen. I've auditioned people. And in a way, I suppose that's what you leave to the producing director. Because you do see a click in people. Do you know what I mean? Even yeah. if it is a... Because yeah. I always say when I do acting classes, and most people do bad auditions. That's the thing. Everyone's nervous. 
So you can't, you kind of see through that in a way as a director. Because yeah. it must be nervous. Is it nervous? Because you probably have an audition for a while. Do you remember the audition process being horrendous? Well, the really strange thing is, and I don't know whether you found this out about me, but because before I, I was in Emmerdale, I gave up acting. Oh, did you? Yeah. I didn't realise that. Um, I gave up acting for two and a half years, and I worked in casting. Oh. With a, uh, with a casting director called Di Carling, who was fantastic. She um, cast This Life. Do you remember This oh, Life? Oh, This Life um, was amazing. Um, with Jack Davenport. Yeah, yeah, Who's yeah. Who's a morning show that we were talking about? Yeah. Earlier. The best drama if you've not seen it, everyone. Oh, God, absolutely. And uh, and Andalyn Kernan. Yes. Anyway, so she was brilliant. I worked with her. So I was always reading in with other actors. And I, I decided that I wasn't going to do acting anymore because I just thought, I can't... Cope with the... I can't, yeah, exactly. The ups and the downs. Yeah. And, so I really saw it from the other side. So when I ended up... This audition just came out of nowhere because my friend wrote, um, was one of the writers, I was suddenly extremely nervous because I, I, I know how awful it is. <laughs> well, I think for actors, because it is really make or break as well, auditions, because you know how amazing it would be when you, if you got that part. It would change, well, life-changing, isn't yeah. it? And, and quite frankly, me getting this part has changed my life in, in every respect. And I think in auditions, you don't really get that much guidance either, do you? About kind of the character. You know, I think a lot of parts people audition for, and then I think we're always looking for someone to come in and give it something. Yeah, that's right. And that's what Di, who was the casting director I worked for, she said, it, for us, as a casting director, you want them to come, you want that person to walk through the door. You know, and we go, that's Laurel Thomas. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And and it's, oh, it's it's terrible it's because some people come in and they're so nervous they do blow it. Yeah. Um, oh, when I give tips to actors, when I do these classes, I often say it's risky, but I often say go, try to play against or try to find a way of doing that scene that no one else might do because so many people will do it the same way. It's almost like if something's written to cry, but you don't. if you think about the scene and what the scene's about, you might not necessarily need to cry. Do you know what I mean? And then you give it something different. Yeah, exactly. Which I think you do all the way along when we're working on soap in a way. You have to kind of think about each thing so carefully, don't you, and how you're going to play it. Because, again, I've spoken about this a lot. When you are in a soap, you film everything out of order, so you really need to map your journey in a storyline. Yeah, on, on certain stories or episodes, yeah. You, I, I sometimes do that as a bit of a graft. Um, oh, do you know? Well, in a yeah, weird no, kind of yeah, way, because emotion, highs yeah, and lows and... you can't play it all at the same pitch, because A, it's boring, and B, it has no effect. Yeah. So you might, you know, some writers will, you, you'll do a story of, over, like, over maybe two weeks, and sometimes, you know, they'll have you crying in every episode. <laughs> And, but you it's can't a, do no. that, so because it, it has no sort of power when you do cry. Exactly. So, so we're going to come to one of the biggest storylines later. But you've also had mental Sally Spade, the stalker, <laughs> which was I remember filming. I did a big episode of this because you were just about to give birth, and she set the church on fire. Do you remember? I remember. I was lying on the floor. I don't know whether you remember. I remember this, in the middle of the church. I remember. Go on. You say. Well, and I had my obviously huge belly, <laughs> which and, we weren't allowed to show, obviously. No, and one of the grips, Sean, was looking at me, and they were filming. There was fire around me, and Sean went, "Charlotte, I can see your baby moving." <laughs> I do remember that. I was like, "Yes." <laughs> It's kind of the crazy times of working drama, the best, they're mad times, aren't they? Yeah, mad times. But do you know what? It was great. It's amazing. It's fine great. And, yeah. and, and, you know, everything was fine. So you've had her, you were carjacked by Ross Barton, uh, yeah. Mike, you came into it, which led to alcohol, alcohol, I can never say this word. Alcohol. Al alcoholism. Al alcoholism, yeah. yeah. Which again, so kind of goes against everything, but again, reflects real life that people can suddenly go down a, a bad path. Is it tough taking on a big storyline like that? Like, do you feel the pressure of, representing something that you know people probably at home are going through. Yeah, I think with the alcohol story, I was really careful about how I was going to play drunk. Yeah, it's so hard, isn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. that's, yeah, it's really hard, isn't it? And uh, you, I, don't, you know what you like when you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Annoying, I think, <laughs> for me. So I'd done quite a bit of research. I spoke to a lot of people, um, worked with charities, uh, watched a lot of films and, you know, YouTube, just, just watching people drunk and actually what and how people really behave. And I kind of came to the conclusion that sort of less is more, actually. Yeah. And that was the most daunting thing about that story is trying to get that right, you know, because it really 
as a mother, you know, we had lots of scenes where as a mother, I'm drunk in front of my kids. And there's um, a scene where I remember Laurel filled up her orange at breakfast with vodka and then immediately, was it a drunkard, didn't she? In the oh, show. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I suppose people listening to make it really clear, because it is what we do and soaps do. You always work with charities, don't you? Really closely, which is an important part of the whole process when you mm. do storylines like that. Just so explain how that works. You go and meet people that are suffering from the same kind of things or? Yeah, or you, you, uh, the researchers put you in touch with, you know, those people, you can speak to them on the phone, you can meet them, you can go to these particular centres or whatever really you want. All the information is out there. So yeah, I try and do as much as I can. And then we'll get, get to the story that obviously I did, which I still say is my proudest moment in television. We did, I mean, it sounds, I'm smiling as I say, it's awful, but we did the cop death episode. But I just remember that time being, because what I remember is the writing was brilliant. What I remember about the episode was the writing was very adamant that they were going to make anyone at home watching relate to one of the characters in the episode by their reaction, because everyone reacted really differently. Like your dad, Doug, reacted differently to your mum, and um, Jasmine, Jasmine acted differently to you. But it was incredible to film in that episode, wasn't it? As hard as it was, it was incredible. I just remember those days of... It was... Well, we had... In fact, it was so long ago, we didn't have... So there was social media wasn't around. No. The, the phones were around, weren't they? But I do remember you made quite a big decision in telling that story as... You, well, I remember you saying to me, I'm going to film the whole thing on Steadicam. Yes. And no one had actually ever done that in, in, in Emmerdale. Studio. No, I didn't In studio. Had, yeah. And I think, ever, uh, you know, I think, I can't remember who the, Kath, was it Kath, one of the producers at the time? Yes, it was Kath. I was a bit was like, nervous, oh, yeah. like, oh, that's not our kind of genre, we don't really, or, oh, you know, it's not the format we use. And, um, t but actually, because the, the, the moment she finds... The, her baby isn't yeah. breathing. It's yeah. so, it's, it comes out of absolutely nowhere, nowhere. like it would. Yeah. But suddenly, everything is unsteady and it gave that edge of being out of control. I think that rawness, isn't it? Which now is used loads. But I just, well, I just always remember thinking, I don't want to have to do this again. Because obviously, it, when the way again, soap works for people listening, you have three cameras in the studio and people need to hit marks. And, and it, it, it kind of felt like it wasn't that kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? It was just, the mayhem wasn't it? we didn't really rehearse did we we did a really rough loose kind of this mic but and i just remember you coming down the stairs will remain for me forever i think it will i remember the whole crew were in tears how do you prepare for something like that i mean that is because as an actor obviously you're separated from the real you but just sometimes you have to relate it back to you do you know what i mean if that was to happen to me do you do you think things like that when you do a storyline yeah i mean i can comp so I, can, I can put things into certain boxes. I mean, I, I, my middle child, is, I just had a baby, and um, my middle child it was the same age as the baby in the show that died. So it, th that was obviously, that was pretty hard. Um, you know, and you do have to sometimes go to quite dark places, but I, I yeah, I, you just get in the zone, don't you? And again, doing it once is always the best. Because you know you only have to give that once. Because it yeah, does take it out, you yeah. must... I think we all took that home at us, with us every night, that storyline, because we knew what we were doing was so important again. You know what you're doing is so important. Yeah, and I remember, do you remember the doll, the doll we used? Yeah, it was. So they, so... The, it's the it first was, time I think they'd used one like that as well, Yeah, wasn't it? a real life doll, which is like a real life baby. It has limbs, it, all the way, when you hold it, it's exactly like a baby would be. It would fall like a baby. And I said, I don't want to hold this baby until the take. Because I, I didn't really, I'd never really held it. No, and yeah. when I held it, it was like I was holding oh, a dead baby. I know, it gives me, it makes my yeah. hand stand on it now, doesn't it? Because it was cold. And that's, a, you know, talking to, to, you know, mothers that have been through this, you know, that's the one thing, holding a cold baby is not... Oh, you, you can know, never, no. You never forget that. Thing. And do you remember the reaction? Because I always, it will always live me for life, that well, there was one letter that a woman had written in saying... They had suffered, you know, their baby had died of cot death and they hadn't talked about it as a couple. And she sat down to watch it and made him watch it. And they spent all night crying and talking about it. Like, it literally makes me get emotional. That's, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, in fact, it, that was a lady that said that they just watched it. He didn't say anything. And then he just reached over and, and held, held her hand. hand. And, oh, oh, and then they stayed, yeah. Just, that's, I think when I first realised the power and the importance of soap, because... Unlike a film or unlike a drama that's on maybe for two parts or a film once, 
like a, dra- a soap opera is in people's houses every night. So they live and breathe these characters and they also see the process in, ca- not real time, but you know, like they can really focus on it and, and live and breathe these stories with the characters they grow and love. I think that's so, so important what we do in the soap, isn't it? That In that term. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real life stories, it's real people, and sometimes the stories are uncomfortable, but those stories have to be told, and sometimes they're, they're difficult to tell, but people, by watching them in the comfort of their own home, it can, it can help people so much. Yeah, I spoke to Shane Ward in the first episode, and talking about the male, male depression, and, so it's, and, it's, and he said, still to this day, people will just look at him and like, give him a thumbs up, like really macho men, and he knows instantly what they mean. Yeah. Which is incredible, isn't it? It's incredible that you can hopefully help people in that way. Yeah, I, I, and actually, over that ep, I remember um, the cashier at Waitrose, I was putting off my shopping through, and it was a big shop, and right at the end, she just, I, I paid for it, and she just looked at me, and she, her, her eyes were full of tears, and oh. She just went, my baby died like, like yours did in, in, oh. in Emmerdale. And it was just that moment of like connection. And she just wanted to say it. She said, but I, I've never really talked about it. Oh. And it was just that, you know, there was me with my shopping. I know, I it's like, okay, it not you, but yeah. Yeah, but, but she, want, she felt a connection. And yes. I, oh, I just wanted to give her a big hug and yeah. say, you know, so. It's incredible. And what, and what also is incredible, I think, because Emmerdale wasn't a, it was a big soap, but we weren't like, one of the big three then. And I think we were the first to do kind of a really big, brave storyline. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I know others have, have, but it was kind of out of the remit of Emmerdale as well, wasn't it? It wasn't, hadn't really, Emmerdale was always quite fun and... It was uncomfortable, wasn't it? Yeah, because it felt like we did. And then obviously, I mean, on the same side of cheering up, we went to the Soap Awards, do you remember? And we did win, didn't we? The best, I think best single episode? And then I watched the clip recently because I always thought you should have won one best actress and you did finally win, I think, in 2017. And you were genuinely, obviously, totally moved by that. Because I remember, sorry to everyone, when you didn't win that, I think the best thing was everyone who went up that night mentioned you and John. Oh. And the fact that you should have won. But what's, I mean, awards are awards, but is it amazing when you get recognised for your work? Oh, it's kind of like... Um... It's a dream and it's a nightmare because yeah. um, it's a dream because you've won, but it's a nightmare because you've got to go up, go and, up and make a speech. Yeah. Do you remember when we won the single episode? And I think you spoke to June Brown and I knocked into John. John knocked into you and we nearly sent June Brown flying down the stairs yeah. live. Yeah, can you imagine? <gasps> can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> getting rid of one of these senders biggest actors. Um, so, no, that was amazing. That was a brilliant time. Now, also, you had a great family because you had Duncan Preston playing your dad, Paula playing your mum, Jenna obviously playing Ashley's niece, who's gone on to amazing things. Like, what's it like when you know Duncan Preston's coming to play your dad? Oh, God. And Freddie, you can't remember Freddie. Freddie Jones, I Freddie know. Jones. We we've been so lucky, haven't we? I mean, all of them are just legends, all of them. And I do remember when Jenna started, she was 19. And I mean, I, I remember doing a scene with Jenna and I, I kept, Getting so distracted because she was so beautiful. I know, yes, she was. I was sort of looking at her thinking, how can you be so beautiful? I just kept forgetting my lines. <laughs> but, um, but she's just lovely, isn't she? And, and it's amazing to watch someone fly, isn't it? When they leave. Isn't it? And yeah. she's such a lovely girl. So I, I wish her, you know, all, all, all the best. I mean, Duncan, amazing. Um, you know, I've grown up watching. Watching Duncan, I know. Yeah, and you still Wood watch and... those documentaries on, you know, with Judy Waters and, and Victoria Wood. He's just brilliant, and I love Duncan. I get on really, really well with him. And then Freddie, I think, used to, I just used to, what, every scene here playing away, I don't know, there was, a, he just, he, there was just something in every word he said, wasn't there? Yeah, he was just rich. Wasn't yeah. He? he was just, what he brings is, is just a wealth of richness. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't have to do anything, and we were just so blessed to have him, um, you know. And then obviously recently, or not, well, quite recently, you've done um, John's big storyline when he left, another really serious, you know, story dealing with dementia with poor Laurel for you. <laughs> the end scene of that, but that must be quite hard, seeing someone you love working with in the show leave as well and go. Yeah, and I, it was, it, that, that was quite a journey because John knew about that story two years before, know, yeah. you know, so he knew... Um, even though it was an incredible story for him, he knew that there was only one ending. And at first, when we started it, his demise, as it were, it felt like we still had two years left. And then before you knew it, we were there. And and his, you know, his dementia had got, obviously, the story had got worse, worse and worse and worse. And, worse. and 
you know, it was it was really very moving. To, he, I think he played it beautifully. Oh, he was amazing. And I'd left by that point, but seeing him get... I mean, again, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a blessing getting an amazing story and being so important, but then it's horrible because you know you're leaving. Yeah, Leaving yeah. the show. But what a high to go out on. And his singlet where he... Oh. That is now used in um, the Alzheimer's Society and they play that episode to the families oh, wow. of people who have a you know a family member who've been diagnosed because it just sort of teaches people about how you know through the eyes of somebody with dementia you know it how something like money in your hand they might look at it and all they can see is just faceless coins yeah 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 and a footwell getting into a car is is the biggest deepest hole you know it was beautifully written wasn't it it was it was brilliant and then and i love john and then obviously you got with mark in the show marlon i mean i knew you had i always think is it weird is that is it kind of like in real life leaving you know going on to a next partner do you kind of think do you sometimes get through and you're like, oh, oh i don't think i what do you know what i mean that you know that you're with suddenly a new leading man it's like oh i feel like i'm cheating well yeah because you're suddenly <laughs> eating lunch with somebody in the canteen new you know yeah. <laughs> and you feel, because you're working with them so you sort of end up having lunch with them and then yeah I, i've been having lunch with quite a few people <laughs> over the years um because laura did go a bit when she was in um, drinking lots she was yeah, i remember you woke up in a bed and you didn't even know whose bed you were in i know but um yeah i suppose that's just the nature of it isn't it you know you get about yeah, pause. so let's that's emmerdale oh actually i did have actually just a couple of funny could like to see whether you can you know how much you know about laurel Name, are there, what, name three jobs she's had. <laughs> um, cleaner. Yeah. Singergram. Yeah. Singergram. <laughs> Singergram. B. Singergram. And she works in the factory. Yeah. A packer, they call it online. <laughs> a packer. Oh, in you were a supervisor as well. Yeah, I was. Yeah. When Laurel sold her business to David, well, this is easy actually, which niece of Ashley did Laurel clash with? Oh, Jenna. Jenna, yeah. She was Ashley's niece, wasn't she? Yeah. Oh, was she? But hadn't she killed somebody by that point? I don't think she had killed, but no, I don't think she had quite by then. Because then you went to, Laurel went to, no, that was my last question actually. What did what punishment did Laurel get for uh, perverting the course of justice when Yasmin ran away? Sally Spade. <laughs> no, Sally Spade and 40 hours of community service. Oh, God, yeah, yeah picking litter. <laughs> yes. Poor oh, Laurel. Oh, dear. Poor oh, Laurel. <laughs> So let's move on to you. So you were born in Dover in Kent. Did you always want to be an actor when you were young? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I was rubbish at everything else. Like, as in, like, I was rubbish at maths. I was rubbish at... And who doesn't want to muck about in drama? I mean, it's so much more fun than oh, yeah. doing algebra and all of that. Me? Do you remember your first role at school or whatever? Oh, Do you remember I the mean, first? the weird thing is, you can laugh, and like, this is no word of a lie, but I was a B in The Wizard of Oz. What are you? Yeah. We, there was like, when, yeah, reception when? class were all bees. You know when, you know when the monkeys came. Oh, yeah, yeah well, we didn't have monkey suits. It was cheaper to have us all in black and black and yellow. So we had the whole class. You know, Mrs. Finch's class were bees. That's amazing. I know it's a bit of a full circle. So Maybe I'll die around. a bee. Maybe you'll finish in this big, profound role in a Hollywood movie. As a bee. Or maybe I'll just do some show in the village hall when I'm 90 and some... <laughs> yeah, I mean, Laurel's going to go as a bee somehow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you attended Middlesex University, studying performing arts. How was that? Would you say to people listening to this who want to act, is going to drama school a good thing to do? I wanted to get a degree just in case I, you know, wanted to teach. I suppose it, it was more of a backup. But I love I love university. I met my husband there. I oh, met, did you? Yeah, oh, right, right. And I look back on those days and I wouldn't change him for the world. And were you then, at that point, were you kind of thinking I'm going to be a leading lady or a character actress? Or do you know what I mean? Did you kind of... Never a Never. leading lady. Never a leading lady. I'm just not that, no. Just always the slightly odd one in the corner. <laughs> and, that, and that's okay. That works because, brilliantly. Well, the pressure's off, isn't it? Yeah. And people have made careers on that, you know, as the wacky friend. Yeah, I always love the wacky friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, TV wise, so I did in 1996, you played Elaine in A Touch of Frost. Oh, Elaine. Elaine, it was so oh. Did you work with David? Were you in David yeah. Jason scenes? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's. Oh, and was that your first TV? No, I did the bill. Oh, right, you've done, done the bill. I did the bill. I was so nervous when I did the bill. Uh, because I'd only done theatre, I'd never done telly. I didn't really know how to talk on, being on telly. On telly. Yeah. I didn't know whether... I, I just... I was absolutely... Oh, 
paralysed with fear. So the touch of frost, yeah, I played the ugly friend. <laughs> um, and they thought that I'd killed or pushed whoever it was down the stairs. Um, but that was good fun. That episode had Damien Lewis in. Oh, hilarious. Wow. I know, and he was only young out of... Homeland, from Homeland. Is yeah. that the right one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So Touch of Frost was my first sort of like proper sort of drama. I mean, David Jason, like a god of telly. Yeah, I mean, but that must he, make you... he was so nice. I remember just so nice. But we're talking a long time ago. You know, we had expenses in brown envelopes at that I point. I know, that's when money was like a, you know, I remember Heartbeat that used to be made at Yorkshire Television. And like someone told me how much Nick Berry was on. I mean, it was like the glory days, wasn't it? Yeah. Like they were... Amazing. And Touch of Frost, and everything was watched by like 20 million people or something back then as well, wasn't it? But Touch of Frost. Touch of Frost still gets repeated. So was Elaine a big part in it? Um, not a, like a massive part, but an okay part, yeah. you, know, you know. And you said like being nervous about how to be on telly. Because I always think, you can tell, I always find the most distracting people, the extras. Because actually it's really hard just to walk on telly, I think. Do you know what, if you've just got to walk along the street, you suddenly think, what am I going to do with my hands? Because you never think about it in real life how you're going to walk. But suddenly you have to think about how you're going to walk. Yeah, I know, you're right. <laughs> it makes you aware, doesn't it? Are you like a proppy actor? Because loads of people get over that by fiddling all the time or something. Yeah, I do quite like props, actually. Not too many, but uh, yeah, I do quite like them. It's distracting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and then you were also in EastEnders as a religious fanatic, Sue Taylor. Yeah, I was in that for eight, nine months. Oh, were you? Yeah. I didn't realise that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. who was she? So, so she was you? part of a cult. Me and Alistair came to the uh, square and we sort of lured Sarah. Do you remember Sarah? Danielle. So she was a blonde. Yes. yes. That, yeah. Oh, we, I remember that story. That was me. Wow. Yeah, hilarious. And I used to wear awful brown jumpers and, and have lots like, of big crosses. And <laughs> say, say to Sarah, like, you need to come uh, on our side, you know. And then, yeah, so I did that for about eight months. It was funny to work on EastEnders and then... Go to on, another soap, yeah. Yeah, so it's very, very different. And was, was when you did that, was Top of the Pop still at Elstree as well? Oh, I can't remember. Because I just remember when I used to do Grange, I worked, worked on Grange Hill, I used to go to the canteen and there'd be like Madonna and then there'd be people dripping in blood from Holby, a couple of people in school uniform and then Doc Cotton. Yeah, because the canteen, everyone <laughs> yes, shared. Yes, everyone just shared. Oh, I remember Martine McCutcheon was in, in it when I was in it. And I remember being completely starstruck by yeah. her because she was brilliant. I loved her as Tiffany. And do you remember walking on the square for the first time and being yeah, like yeah. going? And what about when you joined Emmerdale? The village is astounding me when I joined. It still does, and I never forget Freddie Jones, who obviously has done a billion films. You know, said on his first few days, he 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 said this set is like nothing I've been on. And I thought, wow, that's, that's incredible. And to explain to everyone. The village is basically a purpose-built village, isn't it? In the middle of the countryside, you drive down, all the houses are kind of empty, but have got costuming and stuff. But basically, if you, I remember camera scripts at night there, and you would just be like, wow, like, this is mad. Yeah, it's magical, isn't it? It is magical. And when we used to do Christmas and covered in snow. Yeah, lovely. Oh, fake snow. Fake snow, yeah. yeah. But that was amazing. And then also, I didn't know, you voiced, I think you've done something with Buddy and Daisy and... Uh, Buddy and Daisy do write in the CITV series Dream Street. I know. Well, I did quite a lot of voiceovers, actually. Did you? That's what I, 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 I kind of... When I gave up acting for two years, worked in casting, then I did then go full-time into voiceovers because it was really, at the time, quite lucrative, you know. Um, but what's it like voicing characters? Is it really weird? Is it such cartoon. a different way of working? Yeah, I did, I did a Were lot Were you with of... the other actors? No, no, no. And I worked for Henson for a bit oh, as well. Wow. Um, I did a show called Construction Site where I was um, a forklift truck. Um, and I, yes, but there's I did. money to be made in being a forklift truck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I did lots of cartoon voices, lots of sort of young, kind of hip, little mix albums. That sort of, that was my kind of demographic, you know, young and young. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not now, but... Not knowing that side of it at all. What's it like voicing a character? Is it very weird as an actor to be just in a booth rather than... You know, if you don't get because you do you get to see it as you do it. No, no. no. So you're just literally reading a script. Yeah, you are, and then they sort of um, probably mould the things around. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's just a whole different sort of thing, really. And I, I did quite like it, um, but the whole voiceover industry has changed so much over the last twenty years. So and in the last four months, now everyone's last... just doing it at home. Well, yeah, yeah. But what is quite fun is that you would be in Soho and you would get 
phone, a phone call and, right, can you be there in 20 minutes? Oh. Be there in half an hour. And all the studios are in Soho. Oh, right, okay. So a lot of the ad agencies, weirdly enough, ads are all made, you know, so quickly. And the voice is the last thing that gets approval and the script and everything. And so that's why it's this sort of slam, Mad, manic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was quite fun to do. Um, but, you know, I don't know whether I could have sustained it. And do you miss London at all, the, like that madness? Cause it's totally different up here, isn't it, in Yorkshire? It's totally different. And we relocated, me and my husband, you know, 18 years ago or 16 years ago. And we're both, all our friends were in London. And, and I thought, I'm never going to get my husband to be up here and enjoy it. And of course, all our kids have been born here. Yeah, no, and we'd never, it. ever leave. I mean, Yorkshire is, is just the best place. It is. That's what I thought about for my husband. He was, took him ages to persuade. And I was like, honestly, when you live here... Because you become Londonized, I think, and you think you can never leave, and then when you do, you think, you're like, yeah. "Why was I ever? Why was I ever living there?" Yeah. And then you've had, obviously, you've got three kids now. How did that change your life? How does it change an actor's life? I suppose because obviously, acting can take you on tour. It can take you. I suppose being in Emmerdale is amazing because you've got this steady, amazing job. But um, did it? Does it change your outset? Uh, you know, when you have kids and. Well, I think I just feel incredibly lucky that I've been in work as an actor for 18 years and I have been able to have three children and and I've worked right up with, uh, with all my children. So I've been really lucky and to be able to, you know, have be, play a character that I'm really pregnant in real life and I have to hide it. You I know. know that's the funniest thing. It is Suddenly funny carrying thing. massive bags. Whole outfits have changed because costume in soaps often when you get the character you go out shopping and you seem to still be in the same clothes. <laughs> it's like Laura still has that green cardigan. <laughs> but I think you've had probably since you joined. I know. <laughs> so right, the final thing I'm just going to give you. I'm just, that's not your, I'm not your okay. Your little soap in the box. The final question is: Who character in Emmerdale would would you get that to for a good wash, sin wise, as a character, not an actor? Oh, God. I mean, probably Laurel does as well. You know, she's, had, she's been quite bad, really. Yeah, but you forgive her then. Yeah, you forgive her then. Uh, hopefully. Well, I think I probably would have to say Kim Tate, yeah. actually. Because, I mean, some of the things... Some of the things she does... She's just, vile, isn't she? Yeah. She's vile. She hasn't got any redeeming features. But she plays the best soap bitch there is. Yeah, and, I definitely... Um, I applaud that. Mate, so. Yeah. so, yeah, Claire... I'm actually going to talk to Claire, so she's going to have her own run in a way, so she can... It might be herself. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, lovely to talk to you. Oh, and you, Lee. Thanks, Charlotte. It seems almost another time when we were sat above that bar in Harrogate, but those times will be back. Thanks very much to Charlotte for being on the podcast. And we have got some really exciting episodes to come. It's Corrie's 60th birthday soon, so I've got two very big episodes and also two huge episodes for Christmas that are very exciting, one of which I haven't recorded and I cannot wait to do it. Catch up with me all week on social media at Soap From The Box on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Thanks as usual to David Stevens and The Bossy for all their technical wizardry. Have a safe week and remember it's only four weeks until Christmas. I'll leave you with that. Oh God, bye. Bye. <laughs>